Do you know the spirit of homosexuality? If you don't, or there's some confusion in your heart, I have a story to tell you. If you have been sleeping under a rock, as most of us have, you might have missed that the world as we know it will soon end. Levitating boards, robots that seem human, self-driving vehicles, and aliens aren't the highlights of 2024. It's a war among nations, the downpouring of catastrophic weather, of biblical proportions, more and more people being left out in the cold by the system, increasing spiritual attacks and demon possessions, humans that seem to be robots, and everybody's secrets being revealed. But wait, among all those things I've just mentioned, I left out one highly massive event, and I did so because it's incomparable. We are in the end times, the Most High Father Yahuwah timeline for recompense is here. The most unimaginable catastrophe to happen is at hand. Are you ready? This is At Journey 365. I'm your host, Patrick Andrew Kelly. Join us Monday at 10 p.m. for our book tour, When Called by God, a memoir that chronicles my journey from 3 to 51 years old. Discover a story of divine inspiration and personal growth. Key exploration points will be my spiritual awakening, pivotal moments reinforcing my divine connection, challenges I overcame through faith, and the impact of answering God's call. When Called by God is a testament to the power of faith, the beauty of personal growth, and the extraordinary journey that unfolds when we heed the divine call. So join us tomorrow night at 10 p.m. And thank you in advance for listening and spreading the word. This experience will be transformative and impactful. The book, When Called by God, a memoir that chronicles my journey from 3 to 51 years old, is available in hardcover, paperback, digital, an audiobook worldwide through online retailers Amazon, Google, Books a Million, and many others. You can pick up these titles in print by visiting uslmag.com. That's uslmag.com. Get a copy of the digital version visiting magster.com. That's m a g z t e r.com. Or just Google the title when called by God. Inspired by USL Magazine. When Called by God, the copy table book with select chapters from the memoir is also available in print. Order online at uslmag.com or magcloud.com. That's uslmag.com or magcloud.com. Here's a recap of Season 1 and its most profound revelations. A little over three months ago, I was awakened from a dream I fully remembered. It was a conversation between myself and God, but it, it felt like it was face-to-face -face and yet in the most subtle and peculiar way. I seemed to be in a dream state. I remember dreaming about this guy I had met at the gym who was always positive and shared healthy tips with me. I was thinking, why am I dreaming about this guy? Well, from that dream came a conversation with God about him. I asked God, why was I dreaming about this guy? A guy I had hardly known. God said, I want you to get him a gift. I said, a gift? I said, Lord, Lord, why do you want me to get someone I hardly know a gift? I said, God, what kind of gift do you want me to get this guy? God showed me a vision in my mind of a gold chain with a cross. Then God said, he has major trust issues that stem from things that happened to him in the past. We hardly know each other and stuff like that. But I said, God instructed me to get you a gift. God also told me that you have major trust issues that stem from the past. And the guy, he looked away 
And then he looked back at me and he said, um, he said, man, he said, um, usually I'm the one giving people gifts. He said, nobody ever give me anything. And um, he was like, you know, I've been dealing with, you know, some stuff that happened to me between me and my dad from the past. And it has been the thing that has caused me to not be able to have relationships. Like every relationship that I've had with a girl never lasts because of major trust issues that, that you know, stem from the past. And he, he, he kind of looked at me in, a, in astonishment because he was like, whoa, who's this like God that doesn't know me, just total strangers like coming up to me and he was like telling me this. What God told me, not that I doubted him, but was just that I had this connection um, with God from a kid and I still had it. And this is what this, this, this show, this podcast is all about. It's us being 100% authentic in, in who we are and, and telling our trueness so that others can connect to us. As I laid there in bed, the journey of my life began flashing before my eyes, revealing things I had done in the past I had long since forgotten. And as this was happening to me, I became extremely overwhelmed. Some of those memories were deeply buried in the far recesses of my mind, yet they came flowing out like someone turned on a faucet. God began speaking to me telling me that he has molded me since I was three years old with this moment. God said everything I had gone through, the good, the bad, and the ugly, was to prepare me for this day. He said, I see how you pray for people just meeting them or passing them on the road. Something you didn't have to do, but you did it anyway. I just laid there in bed and began bawling uncontrollably. You know, when I was a kid and growing up, I didn't receive a lot of love from my mom and from my stepdad or from my real dad, who still lives in Jamaica till this day. As tears began, as tears began flowing down my face, I felt like um, I felt like I was transcending. I felt um, like I was having an out of body experience. It was something that was happening to me that I couldn't explain. And I was feeling mind blown and I was overloaded. God told me that we are in the last days. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. I just got um, I just got a little old. You know. God told me that we are in the last days, and that within two and a half years from now, life as we know it would become even more devastating, more devastating than now that we see people who are coming outside of themselves and revealing who they truly are. God said, I want you to be the message to draw people to him. I said, Lord, how can I be the message when I've lied and cheated? So, I said, Lord, how can I be the message when I've lied, cheated, and stole, and even laid down with men? And God said, come as you are and be delivered. As I continue falling, God said, I want you to be the message to get people to know who they are to deal with their past traumas, to let go of their hurt, and receive deliverance. When I finally came out of the dream state I was in, I didn't feel like myself. The air I was breathing was different. It was crisp. It was like I was floating on air. I was joyous. A day or so later, God spoke to me again. God told me that the people from the tribe, descendants of Jacob, who was massacred, driven from their land, and was later sold off in bondage from the slavery coast. Their time of deliverance was at hand and that they would take their rightful place. The 430 years was almost up and that everyone who played a part in their demise, their destruction, who took advantage of them, would stand in judgment and lose their standing. Everything they have to those people, they would stand in judgment and lose everything they have to those people. There isn't a stone where they can hide, a building high enough, a bank account too big, or enough lies to cover up other lies. Everyone would stand in judgment. Looking at my life full circle though, God told me I was going to minister to people when I was about nine or 10 years old. And because preaching wasn't my interest, 
nor did I want to minister to anyone. I started running and God chased me and gave me many good whippings. You know, when you ask a child, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? It wasn't a pastor. But now that I think about it, I have been ministering in people my entire life, but I just didn't know it. I was thinking of a traditional pastor on a pulpit, but God knew there would be so many ways he would get me to heed to my calling. See, I grew up in church and I had witnessed so much dysfunction. It turned me away from church, but God was always in my heart. At every turn, God was there. And now I know that every part of my journey was a purpose, a plan by him. Even when I wouldn't run the other way. Now, 51 years old, through God's grace and mercy, my rebirth is now 15 years in the making and counting. Yes, I said and counting because I'm still being delivered. I still have things that I deal with that God is helping me with. As you journey with me and others who will take part in the spiritual awakening, this journey, expect to be delivered no matter who you are, no matter what relationship it is that you have with God. And for those who do not believe in God, he believes in you. And I cannot wait to hear your story. I'm Patrick A. Kelly, and this is my journey chronicled by significant incidents in my life that made me who I am today. At age three, I was molested by a family member multiple times, and then later by a friend of theirs. At age six, I almost died and experienced my first supernatural and spiritual encounter, which has become a part of my being and has always stayed with me till this day. At age eight and continuing on for the next six years, myself and my siblings were tortured. Myself and my siblings were tortured by my mother and stepdad. My sisters were molested. At age 10, my mother used to pit. Me and my sister, who are about to say mother and father, against our sisters, stepsisters. At age 15, I developed a sexual addiction and lasted until my mid to late 30s. At age 17, I was abandoned. We felt alone. We felt alone. And with, with all the, and with all the trauma I had experienced in my life, this experience, it seemed different. And yes, I felt unloved. At age 18, I experienced a mother's love from a stranger. At age 18, my then girlfriend, whom I had lost my virginity to, told me she cheated on me with a friend of mine. And as I sat on the bed, I began crying and I felt like a part of me was disappearing. That day marked the final blow to my brokenness. And for 21 years, I was so many things. So, and I didn't have any strength in my body. It got so bad, I asked God, I said, Lord, I'm ready to go. God was, God was like, it's not your time. It's not your time. I lost everything I had. It was one of the worst moments of my life. But he renewed my body. When I came through that, I felt like a brand new person. And he gave me back everything I had lost. And then so, I lost my voice for a year and a half. I couldn't speak. At 51, God revealed to me my true purpose. And ever since I was a kid, I always knew that there was something special for me to do. I just didn't know what it was. And at 51, after all the running and all the stuff that I had gone through, God finally revealed it to me. At age 51, I overcame the power of lust and had a transcendental experience, an out-of-body experience. At age 51, I stopped running from God and have embraced fully my destiny to the calling to be the message. I just want to say that in order for me to be the message, in order for me to do this podcast and to do the show, I had to lay myself bare as I'm doing now. So you can understand that this isn't a game at all. God is using me. He's using me to be the message for you. And he says, come as you are and be delivered. But in order for you to do that, you have to bear yourself 
to him and everyone because of our strength God don't give us more than we can bear and if he put you through something like what I've gone through or what you have gone through or what you're going through it mean that you're strong enough to handle it and he didn't give you that he didn't give you that blessing for you to hold on to it he gave it to you so you can share it with other people so that they too can be blessed can be delivered and know the love of God I can't tell you how many times I was like, you know what, I can't do this. I'm not gonna do this. But God was there with me every step of the way. He said, if you are gonna embark on this journey, you have to bear yourself. You have to bear your soul to everybody if you're asking them to do the same. So I did it. You know, it was it was very emotional for me. I, a lot of those um, memories you know, f were from way back and they were very strong memories. Some of them were traumatizing, but I thank God that he blessed me and gave me the opportunity to do this. Um, and I hope that by you listening and continuing to listen to this podcast, that you are forever changed for the better, that you are blessed, um, that you uh, receive deliverance and that you also help others to receive deliverance as well. Thank you. Thank you for this. So this episode two, A Tainted Little Soul, is about that molestation, that time that I'm basically taking you guys back to when I was three going on four, um, when I was molested all the way up till I was almost seven years old. Um, so without further ado, here is... A tainted little soul. Some would assume a child at three years old may not remember who they were once four or so decades have passed. But when something so subtle in understanding pours their soul, it transcends time. A memory is so powerful that it, it is never forgotten. It never leaves you no matter how hard you try to forget how little understanding you have of its effect. This memory transforms you into things you don't understand and does it intentionally without regard to you, your control, or anything else that should be a stopgap, a firewall, a protection to tender souls will require security and safety at all costs, at every effort. See, this thing had transformed me, molded me into an incomprehensible something. The transformation was out of my control, and I had no say. Change forever, tainted, impure, and used good was how I felt. But one day my aunt was watching me and she called me into the house while I was playing with my friends outside. When I came inside, she was lying on the bed in her underwear. She said, Papa, come here. Papa is what they used to call me. When I came to her, she removed her underwear and took my little, my little hands and placed it down there. I vaguely remember our conversation, and maybe it was a prime or a demand, but I remember touching her down there. As she kept asking me to touch her down there on different occasions, I began thinking how ugly this thing was, and it felt funny. I didn't know why I was touching her down there, but it felt like I was playing uh, with one of my toys at first. As I got older, around six, I became bored doing that, touching her down there, and I began resisting, and she would force me to touch her. She asked me to touch her down there one day, and I said no. Vaguely, she was saying things to me. I can't recall what she was saying, however. It felt like a defense to why she needed, she needed me to do it to touch her down there. Just before coming to the States, 
I was almost, I think about seven years old. And my uncle and one of my girlfriends, a little person, were at home. I think my uncle was watching me because uh, he was older in his mid to late teens. And I found myself messing around with my girlfriend, touching her the same way my aunt would ask me to touch her. At that age, I still didn't know what that meant. Still, I felt something was changing inside me as I did it. That day marked the beginning of my exploration, and I'm, I thought I was transforming into something I didn't know. I remember playing alone in my grandparents' yard as the summer continued. My Aunt D was, uh, my Aunt D was watching me um, that day, but left me alone. She left me alone to go up the street. Um, after she left, I had a visitor. A young lady uh, who said that she knew my Aunt Dee came by the house and coerced me to go with her by telling me how she knew my aunt. I don't recall what she said, but it made me feel safe. So I went with her and she took me down the gully on my grandparents' land, told me to lay down on the ground and got on top of me and began saying things. As she moved around, all I could, all I could think of was how she felt so heavy on top of me, feeling her warm breath on me and that a stone had started digging into my back. When she finished, I got up from the ground with just my little shorts on. I was naked from the waist up and my clothes were, my clothes were all dirty. When she left, I went back to, I went back to play with my toys. And I didn't tell anyone what had happened to me that day, but it confused me further. I didn't understand. I didn't understand why these things were happening to me, but I was changing and he didn't know why. Later that summer, I came to the States and I never, I never saw my aunt again or talked with her about what she did to me. It was a confusing time. It was a confusing time for me and, and being in the States wasn't different. I later, later developed sexual habits that became even more massive than I was intelligent enough to comprehend. I started becoming confused about who and what I was. I'm not privy to all that God knows or even know his understanding as to the order of the travails of my life. But what happened to me as a child, a toddler, had a profound effect on my entire life. And might not I have been molested by one of my favorite aunts and her friend. Would I be the same Patrick A. Kelly, the one that God wants to use to bring others to him? Would my lack of experience or incidents that molded me to be here right now have been enough to tell this story? Would my life be evident and provocatively sufficient to compel the soul and touch others with experience, similar experiences and incidents to become storytellers and receive strength in their deliverance. I'm quite sure there are many of you out there who something similar may have happened to you or maybe something even worse. And because it frightens you, you're afraid of it or you don't want to deal with it, you bury it far in the back of your mind. I just want to let you know that it's okay. It's okay to confront your past and it's okay to confront those things that have caused damage to you. Tell your story. Tell your story like I'm telling my story and become delivered. Tell your story 
can become delivered through God. Welcome back to at JRNY365. I'm your host, Patrick Andrew Kelly. Before we get started tonight, please join me in an open prayer. Father Yahuwah, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your wisdom, love, caring, and understanding in these perilous times. Father Yahuwah, we thank you for our increased courage and faith. We thank you for your understanding above all. We thank you, Father Yahuwah, for allowing us to become better than who and what we were the day before and to help others to do the same. We thank you, Father Yahuwah, for allowing us to be here right now to witness your prophecies come to fruition. We thank you for your word because we know it will never return void. Father Yahuwah, we thank you for covering and keeping us through all manner of sin and evil, both seen and unseen. We thank you. We thank you for our guardian angels who watch over us, protect us, teach us, and keep us in isolation, protecting us from all manner of sin, evil, witchcraft, plots, plans, and agreements to our detriment. We thank you, Father Yahuwah, for keeping us in your will and given us a purpose and a destiny to fulfill. Father Yahuwah, we thank you for delivering us so that we can appreciate you for who you are and not what you can grant us. May our words spoken and our actions be nothing but upliftment to your name. Father Yahuwah, may our words spoken and our actions be nothing but upliftment to your name, Father Yahuwah and upliftment to your word. May we be a guiding light, a beacon on top of a hill, shining so bright that all may see and glorify our Father Yahuwah, which art in heaven. Thank you, Father Yahuwah. In the name of your Son and our Savior, Yahusha. Welcome to Season 2 of At JRNY 365. We're at a new time streaming at 10 p.m. every Friday night. And we also going to be streaming on Sunday night and also doing the When Called by God virtual tour book reading from Monday to Thursdays. So join us then. Each of those days we will be streaming at 10 p.m. We have assembled a series for you. The topic for the entire season is the spirit of homosexuality, and we will delve into a subject so sensitive, even AI didn't want to have anything to do with it. This season explores the transformative power of the spirit of homosexuality and how it has become a cultural icon, converting even the toughest deniers. From the story of the little baby boy to the unbeknownst flirtation of the heteros and much more. Season two starts with the undeniable questions. Were you born homosexual? Have you considered how your preference aligns with the most high Yahuwah's word? At what point can we have a straight faced conversation about the rapture? And are you ready? Leading into the final episode, the podcast promises to touch on every point from when I turned homosexual to God's word and the homosexual covenant of marriage to the clarion call for saved lives and so on. Between all the chatter, tears, deliverance and so on, we will overcome some personal struggles. We will address broader cultural shifts and explore how our faith can provide a compass in these turbulent times. We'll be joined by thought-provoking guests, share potent testimonies, and offer practical guidance for living out our calling in an increasingly complex world. 
Whether you were a listener from last season or joining us for the first time, I invite you to open your heart and mind as we embark on this journey together. Let's challenge ourselves to grow, to love more deeply, and to be the change we wish to see in the world. Get ready for raw honesty, inspiring stories, and transformative insights. This is at JRNY 365 Season 2. Let's begin. There was a little baby boy born in 72 who was set apart from his birth mother just a couple of years later. See, this little baby boy had a destiny that the Most High knew of preconception and Satan learned early postconception. The little baby boy's destiny was such a threat to Satan that he devised a plan to destroy this little baby boy in any way that he could. Born from a Hellraiser mother who would later play a pivotal role in this saga, it seemed that the little baby boy was predestined for failure and demise. With all who Satan was, with his cunning prowess and several millennia of tricks, he could never account for the many ways the Most High Yahuwah would use even him for his glorification and the safety and protection of this little baby boy. A well-polished and refined plan, Satan weaved his web, sending out a clarion call to all his minions, the ones most professional at their craft. The one minion who answered the first call was attached to the little baby boy's aunt, and it would weave such a devastating blow to the little baby boy that his destiny not to father children was indeed sealed. Traveling almost 52 years into the future, you'll have a clearer picture created to get the complete picture of Satan's hell-bent reason for destroying this little baby boy. See, after the many death attempts, molestation, spiritual attacks, setbacks, broken hearts, torture, and being held in the grips of the spirit of homosexuality, this little baby boy, who was now a full-grown man, walked the earth thinking he was meant to be alone the rest of his life, never to have a family, never to have offsprings, forgotten in the grander scheme of things. This grown man was so cunningly deceived, he even believed Satan's plan and had come to terms with it, for it had taken root in his mind and settled. But that was the basis of Satan's entire plot, to either destroy this little baby boy at his earliest lifespan, and if that didn't work, enact plan B with a continued deluge of attempts on his life while suppressing his advancement, or plan C, where he would create a most elaborate deception to deceive the now grown man to think that he was never meant to have children, a wife, or even feel the affection of unadulterated love, a parting gift indeed to be granted by the spirit of homosexuality. Continuing almost 52 years in the future, this now grown man was approached by the Most High Yahuwah after surrendering to his will, who would tell him he was to have a wife. They would bear 10 boys, the first being born at 54. These 10 baby boys would grow to be the catalyst to usher in the Most High's renewal of his people's walking into their covenant with him and the dawn of a new world less enemies, sickness, poverty, greed, false idols and prophets and many manners of bondage. The little baby boy, now fully grown, 
would also help transform the minds of those stuck in despair and downtrodden by gripping traumas and grief to prepare them to walk into the covenant their people have with the Most High Yahweh. Just three years after that little baby boy was born, Satan's clarion call made its way to a spirit, the spirit of homosexuality that lived in one of his aunts. Now, the homosexual spirit being the granddaddy of all spirits, a spirit that lived and thrived by passing from one generation to the next. That little baby boy's tender psyche was infiltrated like any virus or contagion, it begins to replicate, transforming that little baby boy who never stood a fighting chance, or at least that was what Satan thought. But why was one of the most heinous and lethal of all Satan's spirits let loose on a child, just learning how to walk, to talk, to experience the world around him? The little baby boy never had a chance to defend himself. The spirit of homosexuality grabbed hold of the little baby boy through repeated sexual acts brought on by the aunt. The first sight of corruption began to take hold in the little baby boy's personality as he turned one, two, and then three years old with a personality pre-adolescent and a brain out of formation, the little baby boy begins to transform and become disfigured by the evil spirit. Confusion sets in and an identity crisis looms. A battle over the little baby boy's identity is lost, but the Most High Father, Yahuwah, is left to win the war. At first glance, the little baby boy was becoming something no one knew was possible in that little town which was close-knit by families living there for generations. In Portland, where family trees were as intertwined as Georgia's kudzu vines that crept along garden fences, change came as suddenly. Yet, within this tapestry of sameness, something malevolent was taking shape. This transformation would challenge the town's carefully maintained life patterns beginning with the little baby boy who didn't quite fit the mold. At first glance, the little baby boy was becoming something no one knew was possible in that little town, which was close-knit by families living there for generations. His story began to unfold one summer afternoon beneath the watchful eyes of his grandmother's hibiscus sabadarifa bushes, where neighborhood children gathered to play their usual make-believe games. It was there, amidst the laughter and the golden sunlight filtering through the breadfruit trees, that the first glimpse of difference emerged. The child, no more than three or four years old, ran wild in the yard wearing a dress that had somehow found its way from someone else's dress-up box onto his small frame. The other children barely noticed, absorbed in their play, but the adults who witnessed it felt an inexplicable unease ripple through their carefully ordered world. As silent as the little baby boy's secret life of adult play, he lived in two worlds, one with his dear grandmother and the other with his aunt. Someone had to have placed the dress on that little baby boy or would have questioned it out of concern. Someone should have known that the little baby boy was being messed with by his aunt even before the memory of the whole ordeal presented itself in his first memories. The child's inner world grew increasingly complex as seasons changed and years accumulated. 
in the liminal space between childhood and adolescence, he navigated a labyrinth of identity that few could understand. His dreams became elaborate tapestries woven with threads of alternate possibilities, visions of himself as someone's wife, wearing flowing dresses and experiencing life from a simultaneously foreign and profoundly familiar perspective. These weren't mere childhood fantasies, but rather an intricate universe he had constructed by a psyche disturbed and ever-changing an effect of the spirit of homosexuality. In this private world, he lived out his entire lifetime first dates with young men, wedding ceremonies where he wore white, and even the miracle of carrying and nurturing new life within him. The boy, now a preteen with a boundless and vivid imagination, crafted these scenarios with such detail that they felt more accurate than the world around him. But destiny has a way of asserting itself, like finding its level in water. As puberty approached, something shifted in the teenage boy abruptly, like the victor of a war carrying away the spoils, bringing the first whispers of adulthood understanding. Like a fog lifting from a morning landscape, the feminine aspect of his fantasies began to dissolve, leaving behind a more precise, though no less complex, sense of self. The dresses and dreams of motherhood faded like old photographs left too long in the sun, their absence as mysterious as their arrival had been. What remained was a new kind of yearning, simpler perhaps, but no less profound. The little baby boy, now a teenage boy, longed for male companionship that transcended the boundaries of typical boyhood friendships. He dreamed of finding an ace, a special friend who would understand him without words, who would share his jokes and secrets, who would be there for both the ordinary moments and the extraordinary ones. This transformation wasn't a sudden awakening, but a battle cry of emergence, like a Komodo dragon climbing a tree after hatching, while being preyed upon by the victor of his lost battle in the identity crisis. Previous versions was wrong, a deception of the worst kind that mangled the teenage boy from childhood and created falsehoods and significant doubt in the now teenage boy. In Maryland, where change was viewed with suspicion and the tradition of man and woman was as solid as the cement foundations of its oldest homes, this metamorphosis went largely unnoticed by most. But for the teenage boy, it was everything, a quiet revolution of the soul that would shape his future and challenge his understanding of what was possible, or was it the Most High Intercession? This is At Journey 365. I'm your host, Patrick Andrew Kelly. Join us Sunday at 10 p.m. to continue our series, The Spirit of Homosexuality. Join us Monday at 10 p.m. for our book tour, When Called by God, a memoir that chronicles my journey from 3 to 51 years old. Discover a story of divine inspiration and personal growth. Key exploration points will be my spiritual awakening, pivotal moments reinforcing my divine connection, challenges I overcame through faith, and the impact of answering God's call. When Called by God is a testament to the power of faith the beauty of personal growth, and the extraordinary journey that unfolds when we heed the divine call. So join us tomorrow night at 10 p.m. And thank you in advance for listening and spreading the word. This experience will be transformative and impactful. Discover other titles from AdSpira One, such as Inspire by USL Magazine, which has two recent issues, When Called by God, Patrick Andrew Kelly, and The Embrace Method, Vladimir Louison. 
available in print and digital. The book, When Called by God, a memoir that chronicles my journey from three to 51 years old, is available in hardcover, paperback, digital, and audiobook worldwide through online retailers Amazon, Google, Books A Million, and many others. You can pick up these titles in print by visiting uslmag.com. That's U-S-L-M-A-G.com. Get a copy of the digital version visiting magster.com. That's M-A-G-Z-T-E-R.com. Or just Google the title, When Called by God, inspired by USL Magazine. When Called by God, the copy table book with select chapters from the memoir is also available in print. Order online at uslmag.com or magcloud.com. That's U-S-L-M-A-G.com or M-A-G-C-L-O-U-D.com. Have a good night and may Yahua guide and keep you all. Patrick A. Kelly owns a copyright in and to all content in and transcripts of At Journey 365 podcast with all rights reserved as well as his right to publicity. You are welcome to share the transcript up to a maximum of 400 words in media articles such as the AJC and other notable media platforms on your personal website, in a non-commercial article or blog post, and or on a personal social media account for non-commercial purposes, provided that you include an attribution to at Journey 365 Podcast and link back to the at Journey 365 Podcast URLs. Media outlets with advertising models are permitted to use excerpts from the transcript per the above. No one is authorized to copy any portion of the podcast content or use Patrick A. Kelly's name, image, or likeness for any commercial purpose or use, including without limitation, inclusion in any books, ebooks, book summaries or synopsis, streaming media, TV, film, or any commercial website or social media site, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, threads, TikTok, X, etc., that offers or promotes you or another products or services. For the sake of clarity, media outlets are permitted to use photos of Patrick A. Kelly from the At Journey 365 podcast or licensed photos of Patrick A. Kelly from commercial image platforms. Content shared from Tim.blog.